На Кубу я прибыл 12 сентября 1962 года. I arrived in Cuba on September 12, 1962, as part of the 2nd Missile Battalion of the 79th Missile Regiment, armed with the Mobile Medium Range Missile System R-12, also known as SS-4. Our journey started in the port of Sevastopol in Crimea, on a dry cargo ship, Kimovsk. After we passed the Gibraltar Straits, we found that we were bound for the Cuban port of Casilda. Before then, we were told that our regiment was participating in an exercise in a remote area. Such was the legend, made up to ensure the secrecy of our deployment to Cuba. At that time, in the rank of lieutenant, my job was assistant head of missile armament service of the battalion and was personally responsible for the transportation, technical serviceability, and preparation for the use of the battalion's armaments. Those included six combat and one combat training medium-range ballistic missile R-12. When we arrived in Cuba, we unloaded the weapons and military equipment, marched and established our field position near the town of Sagua La Grande, in central Cuba. We began the construction of launch sites for four launchers and technical support facilities. Our position was on the edge of a palm grove next to a sugarcane field. That is, we were in a wide open field, not equipped in any way. Our battalion was brought to readiness on October 18, 1962, and the entire regiment, two days after that. I left Cuba after the critical phase of the crisis was over. 28 On October 28th, we received an order from the Minister of Defense of the USSR to prepare the regiment for redeployment back to the Soviet Union and to dismantle the launch sites that we erected. By October 31st, we completed the dismantlement of the launch sites and prepared the regiment's missiles and technical equipment for transport back to the port of Casilda. On November 2nd, as part of the convoy with missiles, I departed for Casilda and on November 9th sailed for the Soviet Union on board freighter Leninsky Komsomol. We arrived at the port of Nikolaev in Ukraine on November 29th. From there, the missiles were transferred back to the arsenals of the Strategic Missile Forces. That's how my expedition to Cuba ended.
Still, during my stay on Cuba, for the exemplary fulfillment of combat tasks, as was stated in the order of the commander of the Soviet group of forces in Cuba, General Piev, on November 3, 1962, I was promoted to senior lieutenant. After our missile battalion established itself in its position on Cuba, I personally had one main understanding, to do everything possible to fulfill my military duty if I received an order to execute a missile launch. There was no luxury to contemplate anything else. We worked 16 to 18 hours a day with no days off. The timelines for bringing the battalion to combat readiness were tight and we were not allowed to use engineering equipment in order to avoid detection. Our main tools were a pick and a shovel. The Cuban soil is rocky, only 20 to 30 centimeters of topsoil, so there was no time for contemplation. As the person responsible for the testing and preparation of the missiles for their combat readiness, I was fully consumed with that task. After crossing the Mediterranean and Atlantic and encountering rough seas, the critical nodes and systems of the missiles had to be tested, and indeed, there were malfunctions that we had to fix. In addition, we did not have the necessary information to be able to assess the current military political situation in the world. The information we received was strictly controlled and it was not possible to obtain any other. We had no radios or other means of getting information. But after our regiment was put on high alert on October 23rd, and American planes began flying over our battalion positions at low altitudes, and Cuban anti-aircraft gunners opened fire on them, we realized that this was a pre-war situation and began to prepare for combat actions. On October 27th, we were informed that in the next few hours there's a possibility of an American landing. With the support of motorized rifle and tank battalions from the group of Soviet forces in Cuba and units of the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Cuba, they were to provide us with cover in the case of an American landing. We prepared to repel the landing and increased our readiness to launch missiles. On the night of October 26th to the 27th, nuclear warheads were delivered to our regiment from a central warehouse located on the outskirts of Havana in special tunnels in a mountainside. We had prepared our missiles for mating with the warheads in anticipation that the command launch may come at any moment. We 
что команда на выполнение этой операции может поступить в любой момент. А о том, что в период острой фазы Карибского скрилинга творилось в Советском Союзе и в Соединенных Штатах, да и в целом в мире, We learned about what was going on in the USSR and the United States during the acute phase of the Caribbean crisis and in the world as a whole, only after returning to the Soviet Union. As I later found out, the command of the group of Soviet forces in Cuba had the necessary information about the situation both in the USSR and in the world. However, it did not share this information with us lower-ranking officers. Such were the directives from Moscow. То, оценивая по прошествии времени с позиции сегодняшнего дня событий октября 1962 года, я остаюсь убежденным, что решение Советского Союза разместить на Кубе Evaluating the events of October 1962 from today's standpoint, I remain convinced that the decisions of the Soviet Union to deploy the group of Soviet forces with nuclear missiles to Cuba, despite its seeming adventurousness, was correct. It was an adequate response to the prevailing circumstances. It was necessary to protect the Republic of Cuba, which became an ally of the USSR, from American aggression, for which the United States was actively preparing with Operation Mongoose and making no effort to hide its preparations. In the Caribbean, the Americans had absolute superiority in conventional weapons and only a group with nuclear weapons could counter this. There was no other option. То это носит с 27 на 28 октября. Тогда мир находился на горе. As for the most dangerous moments of the Caribbean crisis, this was the night of October 27th to the 28th. Then the world was on the verge of a third world war with massive use of nuclear weapons. As a direct participant in those events, I thank God that at that time he did not deprive the leaders of the Soviet Union and the United States of wisdom and political will. Nikita Khrushchev and John F. Kennedy were wise enough not to succumb to emotions, humble their ambitions, and not cross the fatal line that separated the world from a nuclear catastrophe. As for the lessons of the Caribbean crisis, I will highlight three. The first lesson is that to defuse a nuclear standoff, the two sides must compromise. Могли достигнуть этих компромиссов, они должны иметь непосредственную прямую линию и связи между собой. The second lesson is that for the heads of states to reach this compromise, there must be a direct communication line between them. That is, there needs to be a systematic dialogue during the crisis, not only an exchange of press statements or even an exchange of diplomatic notes. Only a dialogue between two leaders can give rise to trust between them, can provide understanding of what each of them can compromise, and what concessions can be made. Не может уступить другая сторона. На этом основе сделать вывод, что я могу сделать и уступить. Третий урок, который извлечен, the third lesson is that nuclear powers, especially nuclear superpowers, must avoid any direct clash between their military forces, because any direct military clash is imbued with a high risk of escalation to nuclear war. Ибо прямое столкновение между ними чревато огромными рисками перерастания в ядерную войну. You've just heard 
a thoughtful analysis from General Colonel Aysen. I saw all this from a different perspective. He knew about it a long time before I did. Uh, I knew about it when the American people knew about it. We were, I was a, a, the third senior officer on the destroyer uh, stationed in Newport, Rhode Island. In those days, weapons heads on destroyers, I mean, uh, department heads on destroyers were all supposed to be lieutenants. If he was so short of experienced officers that it had established an interim role of one lieutenant, and we didn't have that. So with three years service, I was the third senior officer on the ship. We uh, were notified about three hours in advance that we were going to get underway. We had no idea why. And as it happened, we had a dinner planned. And so we were all in a mess dress, the sort of thing we did in those days. So we went down to the ship, had our dinner, turned on the television set, listened to the president. The Commodore's wife stood up when they played the national anthem. All of us did too. And we immediately got underway, came back about a month later. Most of the experience of the quarantine uh, is boring holes in the ocean. Uh, and that was what most of our experience was as well. Uh, but we didn't understand that, at least at first. The op order, which we received immediately prior to going get to see, used the term blockade. And the captain made clear that was an act of war. So we left port believing we were at war. And many of us had assumed, we were very naive in those days, that we would not finish our naval careers. I was commissioned in 59 uh, without a major war with the Soviet Union. I don't think we were smart enough to understand that that would have ended civilization. Uh, but we, we assume that. So we're at war. We've always known we're going to go to war. Uh, I actually had the terms and decrypt the message that came in to change the word to quarantine to make it clear that we did not want this treated as an act of war. In your earlier discussions, there was a comment from an army officer that they at his level, knew nothing about the broad situation. And that was true for us as well. In those days, it was very difficult to get uh, press when you were at sea. Uh, and we received relatively little information on the situation. Uh, is a foolish person who will argue with Bill Zellico, um, who I had the privilege of working with for part of my career on any subject. But while I agree with him that you can't tell all the lieutenants what your strategy is, you need to have the people actually in potential contact understand where the risks are. So let me just point out a couple of things we didn't know. We didn't know that there had been a message sent to Moscow of how we would signal that we wanted Russian submarines to surface. I'm not sure we knew that that was our policy. I had never heard that until I read the Dobbs account of it. Uh, and so we went to sea in an environment in which if you found a Russian submarine, you were supposed to maintain contact until they forced them to the surface. And that would display our superior ASW capability. Uh, we didn't have any contacts. We had one we thought we had it was false contact. But as you all know, there were contacts 
and there was the potential, at least, for the use of nuclear weapons on the part of the Soviet side, which, at least at my level, and as I understand generally, we were completely unaware of. We knew the Foxtrot was a good uh, submarine. Uh, we did not understand yet how badly maintenance in the Soviet military was carried out. So we didn't understand that the Foxtrots were uh, in poor shape, but we did understand that they were capable submarines and that they had um, a long endurance. You heard it suggested that if the possible decision to use a nuclear torpedo against a destroyer were carried out, it would not necessarily result in a nuclear war. And, you know, the, the, the good thing about speculating on nuclear war is we're data free, so we can all have views. But let's just think of what would have happened later when we were using anti-submarine forces more dramatically, including carriers. The Essex carrier had a crew of about 2,600 people. That's sort of the same order of magnitude as the people who died at Pearl Harbor and at 9-11. And at least in both of those, there seems to have been American bloodlust to do something big. So I am less confident that we could have controlled escalation, even with wise uh, leadership. General Yason gave you some broad conclusions with the sole exception of was putting them in the, uh, Cuba a good idea at the beginning. I agree with all of this. Let me give you some other things to think about from the standpoint of the operational forces. We lacked then, as I've just suggested, good communications between the two militaries. We have added that now in deconfliction, first in Syria and now potentially in Ukraine, but those are very limited channels. We desperately need a channel to allow for communications of dangerous incidents. We have agreements, incidents at sea, dangerous military activities, we analyze them after the fact, but we have no procedure for communicating rapidly. So that might be a suggestion for a future arms control uh, agenda. We didn't know the weapons, the tactical weapons were at sea. That's very dangerous. And so at least having a confidence building measure of what nuclear weapons are being carried in broad terms between all of the various dyads of potential nuclear confrontation, Russia, United States, US, China, India, Pakistan, India, China, having some understanding of what is and isn't in the arsenal strikes me as an unfinished business from the lessons of the Cold War and particularly the Cuban Missile Crisis. And finally, it seems to me that one of the lessons we haven't mentioned yet is the importance of equality, the importance of believing that you don't need to do things to redress an imbalance or gain an advantage. Well, we've come to dress that up with strategic stability considerations, which I think are important and thoughtful. But the basic message is uh, 
between large scale powers, we cannot seek advantage. We've tried maintaining equality through arms racing. That was pretty expensive. We've tried maintaining equality through arms control. That has its own set of concerns. But it seems to me we must find a way um, in the aftermath of Ukraine to restore the notion that both sides have to accept rough parity as a need for survival. Finally, I want to return to the importance of political analysis. You've heard earlier that that was not the job of the intelligence community as they saw it. And certainly for most of my career, what I've looked at uh, in the intelligence, in my operational career, which ended 40 years ago, um, we looked primarily at orders of battle capabilities, doctrine, what have you. But understanding the importance of the political culture of an adversary strikes me as very important. My final point was made well by a couple of people. The advantage that the United States had because many of its senior officials had real-time experience in war and the military and thus knew that things that sound good in theory tend to get messed up in the fog of war. We've lost that largely. And the substitution for it has to be a way without turning over foreign policy to the military, because the military's solution in Cuba would have not been the right one. We have to turn, find a way to make sure that leaders understand the realities of friction on the fog of war. Uh, finally, I point out to you an interesting fact. General Colonel Yason, your moderator and I spend part of our time in a dialogue sponsored by the National Academy of Sciences, trying to solve these problems. And many of them that we are trying to solve um, or trying to provide advice to our governments to solve sound remarkably like what we've heard so far today. Thank you. I'm going to give you my account of my personal participation in the Cuban advantages of being 95 years old as you can participate in the, in the, in the Cuban Missile Crisis. General Yesen and Lynn Brooks participated as actual operators in the actual operations. I did not. I participated in the planning, in particular, in the intelligence assessment. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Uh, I think a fair question is, how did I get involved in the intelligence assessment? I was not in the government. I was a uh, civilian. In fact, I was the director of an electronics laboratory in California. I got involved, I guess, indirectly because of Sputnik. The United States government was stunned and embarrassed when the Soviets launched Sputnik. <laughs> it demonstrated not only were the Soviets ahead of space, which is embarrassing, but they might very well be ahead in a missile program, which is more than embarrassing. It was considered dangerous. So in this security crisis, I guess the government pressed the panic button. They had essentially few or no or few missing scientists in the government, but there were many in industry. 
And so to get this technical expertise together, they made a very unconventional use of people in industry to do what was effectively government work. And that's how I got involved. In particular, they formed something called the jam session, the jam session. And that jam session, the group was convened every time a U-2 would fly over this missile range in the Soviet Union, which happened every few months back in the late 50s and no. Um, they very rapidly got those photographs, developed them, sent them down to Washington, and then this team of scientists would come and evaluate them. I was one of those scientists. Uh, Dr. Whelan also, well, I'll mention him later. Uh, we spent three days and three nights analyzing what was going on at the Soviet missile range and then wrote a detailed report explaining and interpreting that. In the 1960, the U-2 was shot down, but just in time, the Corona satellite was available and it took over the, the role that the U-2 formerly had been doing. And so the jam sessions continued using this new photography. So these jam sessions have been going on for five years at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Two members of that, Whelan and Perry, Whelan was now the deputy director of CIA, and in that position, he called me and asked me to come back to Washington to do an intense analysis of the missiles that the Soviets were deployed in Cuba. I had done a very detailed analysis of the SS-4 as it was under development in the Soviet Union, and now he wanted me to do the same thing on the SS-4 as it was being deployed in Cuba. The way the system worked is that the Navy flew low-altitude reconnaissance planes over Cuba every day, every morning, about mid-morning, to very high-resolution pictures. The plane then landed in Florida. Another plane picked up the film, flew it through Rochester, had it developed, sent back to Washington. And by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the film was at Washington for our team to analyze. And we worked about midnight analyzing that, those, that film. And at midnight, Dr. Whelan would come in. We would brief him, give him a report. And then the next morning, first thing in the morning, he would brief President Kennedy. So this was a remarkable example of a 24-hour turnaround in intelligence from the time the pictures were taken to the time the president being briefed on what results were and what the analysis of those results, it was about 24 hours. The president found this particularly important because he was in an intense negotiation, as been described in Zay. And in that negotiation, he had advisors who were urging him to knock off the, NBA, the uh, negotiation and invade Cuba. And he was prepared to and had the forces ready for the invasion of Cuba, but he wanted to delay that as long as possible. So his theory was he would delay it up until the time the SS-4 became operational. But he wanted to know just when that was, so he knew how many days for negotiation. So in effect, what we were doing was giving him a few more days for negotiation, which I felt was very well worth doing. I spent the day, almost all the days of the Cuban Missile Crisis, either in the analysis room or in my hotel room. My understanding of the policy and politics came simply from when I was reading the newspaper that, but my understanding of the Soviet missile deployment was probably unexcelled. I had analyzed the SS-4s while they were being deployed in the Soviet Union, and now I was analyzing them. As the same kind of team, a team like General Yesen was on, were deploying them in Cuba. And doing a daily analysis of the SS-4, as it was being deployed in Cuba. At the time, I believed that the Cuban Missile Crisis would end in a war. I believed that that war would be probably end our civilization. Every night that I called home, talked to my wife and my children, I believed might be the last time 
I would have to talk with them. In fact, I believe we survived the cruise missile crisis for two reasons. One, and I will not downgrade this from wise leaders. And secondly, was a good luck. And I think I would raise the second one higher than the first. Now, today we are facing a new crisis, the war in Ukraine. It has the potential of spreading to a wider war, even potentially into a nuclear war. So I leave you with the following questions. Do we have today the wise leaders in place that we need? And do, will we have the needed good luck? Thanks.